Hi, welcome everyone. We'll get started in just a minute. Okay, um, John, you ready to record? We're recording. Oh, okay. All right. Hi, welcome everyone um, to today's webinar. My name is Sarah Carr. I am with Octo, Open Communications for the Ocean. And here at Octo, I wear two hats. Um, I am coordinator of the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management Tools Network, as well as editor of the Skimmer on Marine Ecosystems and Management. Um, and we're very glad you can be with us today. Um, I'd like to introduce um, the webinar and speakers. We have Molly Morse and Valeria Tamayo Cañadas from the Benioff Ocean Initiative um, and the University of Cal California, Santa Barbara. They're gonna be speaking today about the Clean Currents Coalition, a global collaborative solution to the complex plastics problem. Um, before I turn it over to them, I wanted to let everyone know um, how to ask questions. So we are going to um, have a, a presentation by Molly and Valeria, and then we'll, um, we will uh, we'll open it up for questions from you guys. Now, there's two ways you can ask questions. You can send them into the chat panel, or you could um, type them into the question the question panel. Um, the question panel is only uh, visible to the panelists and, and myself and the other organizer. And the um, chat, you can make it visible to just us or to all attendees. Um, you're also able to um, uh, give um, additional information relevant to the webinar in the chat panel, but uh, we also we ask that you keep it relevant to the webinar and be pro professional. Okay, thank you very much, and we'll turn it over to you guys, Molly and Valeria. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, thanks so much for having us. Um, thanks so much to the Octo Network for welcoming us here today, um, and also just want to thank all the participants who are here and listening in. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time to be here with us. Um, and I want to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Molly Morse. I'm a project scientist with the Benioff Ocean Initiative at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And I'm here with my colleague Valeria, um, who's also a project scientist at Benioff Ocean Initiative. And today we're going to be sharing with you about our program called the Clean Currents Coalition which is a global collaborative solution to the complex plastics problem. So we'll dive right in. So for today's talk, um, I'll start us off with just a little bit of background about the Benioff Ocean Initiative for those who aren't familiar with us, and then talk a little bit about the problem that the Clean Currents Coalition is seeking to solve. Uh, and then we'll tell you a little bit about uh, the inception of the Clean Currents Coalition and about how they function as a group and then I'll pass it over to my colleague Valeria, who will share some more about specific coalition member projects. Um, she'll talk about what's next for the coalition, and then we'll end on how you can get involved. So the Benioff Ocean Initiative is a applied marine science research group, which was founded in 2016 at UC Santa Barbara by a $10 million gift from Mark Benioff, who is the co-founder and CEO of the tech company Salesforce and his wife, Lynn Benioff, um, to support science-based ocean problem solving at UC Santa Barbara. And at Benioff Ocean Initiative, we have a particular process for initiating what we call our larger scale flagship projects. And so the first phase of that is coming up with an idea and ideas for all of our projects are crowdsourced on our website where uh, once per cycle, which is roughly every two years for us, 
our team of scientists and expert working groups will get together, review all of the ideas that have been submitted on the website and select one that we want to tackle for our next flagship project. The next phase is where we study the problem. So we assemble a group of scientists and other experts who have the expertise and the knowledge to help solve this problem. And then in the last step, we go and solve it. So each project is allocated about $1 million to start um, to invest in this solution. And as you'll see in a few minutes, some of our solutions also attract additional funding as well. And we also have a number of other small scale projects that our team works on to develop plastic, practical science based tools to address important ocean issues. And I won't get into any more of those today, but I'm happy to talk some more about those in the Q&A. Uh, and you can also learn more about them on our website, which is boi.ucsb.edu. And just a few of these photos here demonstrate this idea of um, bringing together these groups of experts to solve problems. So um, the image on the right here is a gathering of experts and practitioners who came together in 2018 to come up with this idea um, of working in rivers to address plastic pollution, which we'll get into about the Clean Currents Coalition here in a few minutes. And the image here in the middle was um, a gathering of all of our scientists and other experts who are working on our other flagship project, which is called WhaleSafe, where we're developing an early warning system for um, whales in the Santa Barbara Channel to help prevent cargo ships from hitting them. And then this last, last picture here on the right is our Benioff Ocean Initiative staff team doing a beach cleanup here in Santa Barbara um, back for Coastal Cleanup Month in September. So next I wanna just talk you through how the Clean Currents Coalition came to be. Um, and we went through this extensive process over the last year to ultimately launch the Clean Currents Coalition. Um, so I'll just talk through this in the next few slides. And so getting to this issue of plastic pollution, you know, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this as an environmental challenge um, with the scale at which it is a problem, it was inevitable, we'd get a lot of submissions to our crowdsourcing platform on our website about the problem. And so we received about 40 submissions, which is quite a lot um, of people really wanting us to work on this issue. And so that really started our journey of finding solutions to the problem of plastic pollution. And so the next step in that journey was to gather input from experts and host a working group here in Santa Barbara of practitioners from NGOs, academic, academics and researchers, um, representatives from consumer good companies, and bring those groups together to really talk about, you know, given Benioff Ocean Initiative's funding, our timeline, our expertise, you know, the greatest needs, um, on this particular environmental problem, what is the best way that we can address it? And that really led us to focus on rivers, um, which I'll talk a little bit more in depth on these next couple of slides here. Um, and so again, I don't think I really need to convince the group listening in on this webinar that plastic pollution is a problem in the ocean. Um, I think most of you are pretty familiar with that. And um, April Crow from Circulate Capital gave a great Octo webinar back in September that summarized it really well. And so I don't really wanna focus on that today. What I do wanna focus on is why rivers are an important piece in the puzzle of, of helping address this problem of plastic waste in the ocean. So scientists have estimated that about 80% of plastic waste in the ocean comes from the land and only 20% is really originating in the ocean itself. Um, the role that rivers play here is that rivers, like the veins that carry oxygen-rich blood throughout our human bodies, carry important water, salts, and nutrients throughout the continents into the ocean. But like our arteries, which, spent, which carry spent oxygen-poor blood throughout our bodies, rivers also carry pollutants and other mismanaged human waste from the continents into the ocean. And so rivers can be this really primary pathway of carrying pollutants um, and have been estimated to contribute about um, 0.47 to 2.75 million metric tons of plastic to the ocean per year. So really a, quite a significant amount. 
And this graphic here from a paper by Emmerich and Schwarz uh, earlier this year really illustrates those pathways. So we have leakage coming from industrial processes that ends up in rivers and is accumulating on riverbanks, accumulating in infrastructure like bridges and dams. Um, and then we also have leakage from consumers, which through transport um, by wind and by water, um, similarly is ending up in rivers and ultimately ending in the ocean. And so sort of another way of looking at this process and why tackling rivers is so important is looking at the life of a given plastic product. And so as we saw in the previous slide, there are various points along the journey of, of a plastic product from production to distribution to consumption to disposal, um, multiple places in that process where it can leak into waterways such as rivers. Um, and where there's a breakdown, particularly in these consumption and disposal phases, um, where uh, we have problems with human behavior, we have problems with infrastructure and capacity in terms of waste management um, that is causing this leakage. Um, so for example, consumers are over consuming single use plastic items and improperly disposing of it. Um, there is impor, uh, there's improper waste management system. So the infrastructure and um, needed to properly dispose of things doesn't exist. And so these different um, actions can create leakage into these rivers. And so as Benioff Ocean Initiative, we found that the way that we could best slot in to implement interventions to this problem um, was to um, come into this consumption disposal phase where we could empower change um, in consumption behaviors. We could clean up the existing plastic waste that is in river systems and through data collection and relationship building influence policy changes. And the ultimate goal of this for us is that if we're successful, to a certain extent, it can turn what is now largely a circular, or sorry, a linear system into a circular one where plastic that is used can then be repurposed or recycled um, as it is pulled out of the environment or properly disposed of by people um, and then taken back to that production phase um, into this more circular system. But with all of that, I do want to take a step back and, and recognize that this solution that we propose here is only one aspect of how to address this problem. Benioff Ocean Initiative has a unique niche and unique resources um, and unique focuses compared to other entities and individuals that also have their own roles to play in this larger problem and finding solutions. And we really do need a combination of different interventions and approaches to create the systemic shifts to really tackle this problem on marine plastic waste. So this next phase uh, in the process here was um, Benioff Ocean Initiative released a request for proposals focusing on rivers and um, we ended up receiving 30 proposals for projects in 16 different continents, sorry, 16 countries on five different continents. And we got a lot of really competitive proposals, which we we're really excited to see. Um, and it was just very encouraging that there are a lot of really innovative, passionate folks out there with ideas of how to address this problem. Um, and we wish we could work with all of them, but um, we we're just really, really encouraged by that. Um, and so the RFP really required anyone who was submitting proposals to meet two primary goals, which I'll walk through next. So um, as Benioff Ocean Initiative, we are really interested in how um, innovative technology can be used to solve ocean problems. And so for the first goal, we wanted to see proposals that were um, developing and piloting a plastic waste capture system in a river anywhere in the world that would intercept plastic waste before it reaches the ocean. And the technological capacity of that particular capture system could range anywhere from something very traditional or to a very innovative novel system. And in response, we saw a wide range of different types of technologies, both on the high tech end of things with a lot of powered mechanical parts um, to more simpler um, uh, devices with much more passive dynamics. 
We also needed to see that each of these technologies was well suited to both the river conditions and the culture of the community in which it would be installed. And so this uh, this graphic here just shows um, just an illustration of a few of the different types of existing technologies like a, um, a trash wheel or a boom and a net or like a conveyor type system, um, just as examples of a few of the different types of technologies that are out there. And the second goal was um, to really get at this idea that we know that our ultimate goal can't just be to clean up or capture the plastic. We need to find ways to address some of the root causes that are making that plastic end up in the waterways in the first place. And so for the second goal, we wanted to see that proposals would communicate about the problem of plastic waste effectively. And to do that, the idea was that they will leverage the plastic that is captured um, and the data that come out of that to conduct community engagement and outreach campaigns to educate the local communities about this problem. Because the more we know about the sources of waste and what the waste looks like, the more effectively we can really address those root causes. And the ultimate goal here is to empower local communities and international communities to take targeted action against plastic waste. So changing consumer behaviors, changing policies, um, improving waste management infrastructure and innovation, changing the practices of companies and, and consumer packaged good companies. Um, and you know, it seems like there's endless number of things to do, but with the data that come out of this, um, we think that we can make a big impact on that. And this image here is just an example of a uh, one of the teams in Kenya who's conducting a community outreach and education event. So um, once we had received all of our proposals and reviewed them, um, we went through a process of selecting our top nine winners. Um, we did that through a process involving Benioff Ocean Initiative scientists and a team of external expert reviewers. And the proposals were evaluated on their ability to demonstrably achieve the goals of the request for proposals. And so next I'll just walk through what some of those criteria were. As we already talked about, we were really interested in seeing technological innovation um, and also how these different projects would engage with communities. And for technological innovation, um, as I already said, that was to test either a new technology or be a novel application of an existing technology. We also really wanted to see that the technologies were replicable so they could be used in other locations if proved successful. And we also were interested in, in this, this ultimate group of nine teams um, to have a range of different types of technologies being tested to just see, you know, how effective are the different types um, and what types of systems and contexts are they more effective than others. And then on the communications and community engagement side of things, um, <clears throat> because data were going to be really important in that side of the project, um, we needed to see that projects have a particular plan for how they're going to collect data <clears throat> and how those data will specifically influence policy change or other actions. And then have um, creative ways of engaging with stakeholders and measuring the impact. And, and speaking of creative ways of engaging stakeholders, as you can imagine, they had to, these groups that we'll talk about here in a few minutes more specifically had to get especially creative with the pandemic on how they're going to interface with people in their communities and internationally. So the next criteria we were looking at was that each of these projects needed to have a plan for appropriate and constructive disposal of the plastic and other waste that they would collect from the river. Um, so an example shown in this image here is to um, use plastic waste in um, construction materials such as bricks for roads or walkways, um, <clears throat> materials for buildings, homes, community parks, um, in some cases where higher value plastics are collected, like PET beverage bottles, those um, in most cases are sold to recyclers. Um, <clears throat> some of the groups are using uh, pretty small scale pyrolysis technologies and pyrolysis is the thermal decomposition of otherwise low value materials at very high temperatures, which can generate fuel that could be used to power vehicles for cooking, um, a number of different things 
Um, but what's really key is that it's without emission of harmful toxins because it's done at such a high temperature. <clears throat> And as you can imagine, there's a lot of organics that are also collected when you're capturing debris floating in rivers. Um, so in some cases, uh, we see groups that are composting that organic material, especially the invasive water hyacinth. And then um, ultimately, you know, there aren't always the best solutions for what to do with the waste. And so um, at the very least, we need to see that groups are responsibly landfilling whatever waste can't be repurposed or recycled um, in a landfill where it's not going to be leaking back into the environment. The next criteria was to show that there was a demonstrated need for this intervention in this particular river. So, um, you know, demonstrating that this river is particularly polluted with plastic waste and that there is currently a, uh, a lack of infrastructure to handle it in that area. We also really wanted to see um, teams that had a real interdisciplinary component to them. So um, teams that had expertise in engineering, um, <clears throat> environmental and hydrological science, community outreach experts, project managers, relationships with government officials. We just really believe in the power of collaboration and, and having expertise in these different areas for the effectiveness of these projects. And along with that, also having really strong local partnerships in these communities with community leaders and um, whoever the government entities are and active community groups, because we really believe that that is important for the strength and sustainability of projects. Finally, the last criteria we considered was, first of all, the feasibility of the project. So how likely is it the project that will be able to sustain for the three years of funding? And secondly, the impact. How likely will it be that this project will make a measurable effect on the amount of plastics reaching the ocean? So after selecting our nine winner proposals, we launched the Clean Currents Coalition in early 2020, right around the start of the pandemic. So it was an exciting time to say the least. Um, and the coalition was launched um, with a uh, a total funding support of $11 million from the Benioff family and from the Coca-Cola Foundation. So um, we're incredibly grateful for their support of this effort and just their vision for um, how this could grow into um, a, a global effort with the impact that it is growing to have. And so the Clean Currents Coalition is this global network of nine different teams that are working both independently on their individual projects and collaboratively as a group of nine to tackle the problem of plastic waste and rivers around the world. The way that they're working individually in their communities is to have these interventions in the rivers, conduct outreach and education with communities, um, but also as a group collectively, the coalition share knowledge with one another. They share resources and lessons learned from their own experiences with other members of the coalition in order to strengthen the overall impact of the program as a whole. This map depicts the nine projects of the Clean Currents Coalition, which are spread across nine countries in four different continents. The um, projects are each, each listed here with the river or river system in which they're working, the country where they are based and the leader of each of the projects. And um, all of the projects are nonprofit organizations or tech startup companies. And four of these are based in the United States and five of them are international companies. Um, but it was really important to us that each of these teams, regardless of where they were based, had really close on the ground ties and relationships. So pretty much all of the project teams are made up of multiple partner organizations and companies, in addition to the one leader that is listed on the map here, um, to make sure that those local ties and expertise were really strong. And with that, I'll pause there and pass along to my colleague Valeria, who will tell you a little bit more about each of these individual projects. Thank you, Molly. And thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, 
Well, these are the nine uh, teams working in the nine different regions that Molly described before. And if we were to put the nine river systems together, uh, we could see them like the next slide. Um, can we move to the next slide? Yeah. So um, that's only to, to realize how different these river systems are and how the nine teams around the world are using different um, capture technologies, but also nine different approaches to work with the local community to tackle these problems. Um, so next slide, please. I want um, to share with you a little bit about one of the main um, aspects of the Clean Currents Coalition, that's the actual um, plastic capture. So nine teams around the world are using different technologies to accomplish this goal. Um, devices range from Kai Tech uh, with active concentration, conveyors and mechanical parks, parts like the familiar trash wheel on the left, um, adapted from Baltimore, um, which will be working in Panama, the Azure system in Ecuador, or the interceptor in Jamaica. Um, also, we have, next slide please, um, we have some other teams um, working with simpler, more passive systems that are lower cost, lower maintenance, and more easily replicable using adaptations of proven structures like traps in Thailand, booms in Mexico, or barriers like the reefens in India that we can see on the, on the photos. The pandemic for sure has uh, delayed the construction of some of these systems, but we have few devices that have been already installed and are capturing plastics already, which we'll share more details about in a few minutes. But as you can see, um, the nine different teams are approaching this in very different ways. Um, due to the differences between the hydrology and the, and the local conditions of the rivers, but also the communities. Next slide, please. We um, also um, wanna talk about how the teams are trying to achieve the second goal of the Clean Currents Coalition. So each team member has a plan to involve the community in the project. Community engagement strategies include um, baseline assessments, for example, like surveying the community to understand their knowledge, their habits, and the needs in terms of waste collection or waste management. Um, some other teams um, are working in communication and outreach activities like riverbank and community cleanup events, communication information and training sessions, inviting local influencers and music local bands, and the pandemic has encouraged teams to get more creative in the outreach because in many cases they cannot gather in person. So we have seen some teams leveraging their social media presence, hosting online discussions, forums, webinars, and educational uh, activities, as we can see here. in this little collage, we have uh, Thailand, Ecuador, and Mexico, like trying to, um, be active and proactive with the community, even if it's uh, on a virtual, at a virtual way. Um, so some other teams um, in our next slide um, are hiring locals to processing capture waste and to work with the maintenance of capture devices, working also with local waste pickers and providing more steady source of income, especially during um, this difficult times in the different regions. And um, some other teams are working in uh, more in, the, in terms of advocacy and policy, meeting with local public officials or expanding the recycling and repurposing efforts, connecting with local and international companies. And now we would like to share with you what three of our teams are doing. I'm gonna invite you to travel with us to Thailand. Um, where TerraCycle um, Global Foundation is working at the Lafrau Canal. Um, we want to invite you to also on the next slide to see this um, simpler but yet effective approaches that um, TerraCycle Global Foundation is taking, which is using trash traps in the canals of Bangkok in Thailand. 
um, they, they have um, two capture devices installed already, and they have collected over 80,000 kilograms of debris. Um, this is not considering like the organic waste that they have captured, and they have also organized nine community events where they have engaged public officials, students, industry, media, um, inviting celebrities and, um, and the general public to, uh, um, to promote uh, and empower a change in the community. They also held an event with the European Union to find some other ways to expand and um, further the efforts that they are doing in Thailand. Um, another, um, another important aspect that the TerraCycle Global Foundation is working there in Thailand is employing local community members who lost their jobs to, due to the pandemic to try to um, mobilize a little bit and reactivate the economy. So next slide, please. Now we're going to uh, travel to Kenya where Smart Villages and Kimolex are partnering to work in the Nairobi, Ngong and Ati rivers. And um, they have um, installed, uh, next slide, they have installed three devices already and um, they have collected over 14,000 kilograms of debris um, and organized four um, community events. In this, uh, they started uh, with prototypes um, that were more passive capture devices like booms and nets and for their initial phase in, in assessing, assessing the sites. But currently they are in the process of installing their mechanical high path capacity capture systems that um, are basically powered conveyor belts. And um, they have um, organized these community events where they are trying to train the community about like uh, plastic pollution using municipal performances and um, awards for most active contributors as a way to incentivize and connect with the community. Also, they are focusing on empowering youth to lead cleanup operations and start green businesses, um, managing a community cooker that it's going to be powered by the pyrolysis of plastics that cannot be recycled. Um, and finally, we wanted to share with you um, the work of Renew Oceans, who is the coalition member working in the Asi River in the holy city of Varanasi, India. The Asi River is one of the tributaries of the, of the um, Ganges. So it's a very important um, river, not only because of uh, its uh, important value as a river system, but also important for the culture. Um, in India, Renew Oceans has already installed four devices and um, the, the idea is to install a network of several simple capture devices along the, the Asi River. Um, they have already installed four, they are called the Refences, and this month they plan to have um, all 10 of them uh, installed. And so um, the data collection activities also just started this month as the CD started to reopen. Um, so we'll have the first data to report on um, next month. If you want to check what they have done, you can follow us on social media or our website as well. And Renew Ocean plans to work with the university student volunteers to, um, and community leaders and they have started engaging these groups over um, virtual channels like WhatsApp um, until it is safe to gather in person. So engaging and employing waste pickers to formalize the existing informal economy and to give them better working conditions, training and more steady income is one of um, the main um, objectives that Renew Oceans uh, has there in Varanasi. And of course, COVID-19 has um, presented challenges um, working with the community. So um, the team has used this time to plan over the last a few months to take advantage of how the city is right now.
starting to open up. And well, uh, as next steps, um, the Clean Currents Coalition is um, planning to collect in data over the next two years and a half to learn how much plastics is diverted from the oceans, how effective the capture devices are, and how the projects are influencing local communities. Also, developing strategies to engaging the local communities and empowering change in a world post-COVID um, is our next step as well. Um, discovering more options for recycling and repurposing collected debris, either uh, connected with local or international um, companies and organizations. Um, some other interesting aspect about the sum of the teams is to develop computer vision tools to promote automated plastic detection and, and data collection through model building. Um, and we know that um, this is only one solution to a major complex problem. Uh, so we do recognize the need to implement this effort in a world in a world where um, we support other approaches such as um, other recovery efforts in oceans and other waterways, uh, reducing single-use plastic production, consumption, consumption, um, innovating alternatives, and improving waste management. Um, so the idea would be to hopefully um, serve as a, an inspiration for other organizations and communities to replicate and scale um, this uh, work. And um, finally, um, we would like to invite you to get involved. And um, just a few suggestions would be do your part in your region. So reduce single use plastics, participate in activities like river and beach cleanups in your community, um, practice the four R's, reduce single use plastics, um, reuse whatever you can, recycle and reject unnecessary wrapping, packaging or items, um, support local organizations that are working to tackle this problem in your region, um, support local legislation that will minimize the production and improper disposal of plastics, um, follow us, follow the coalition in uh, cleancurrentscoalition.org and learn more how to support the teams there. Um, also check out the blog we have so you learn more about the behind the scenes of, um, of each team or sign up for our, our newsletter. <laughs> and um, this is a very, very complex issue that um, we're facing uh, worldwide. So I feel like um, getting inspired, it's a, it's a good part of it. So um, uh, inspire yourself and take action. And finally, um, contact us if you have further questions or more interested in learning more details um, at boi-contact um, at ucsb.edu. And with that, uh, we want to thank you all for being with us today. Um, here you, you can find some of our social media and um, website information, as well as Molly and, um, and myself's uh, email addresses. And now we're happy to take questions. Oh, thank you so much, Valeria and Molly. Uh, thank you for presenting. Um, we have, I just want to remind everyone how to ask questions. You can send them in through the question panel or the chat panel. And the chat, you have the option to um, make them visible to everyone on the webinar. Okay, so we had a question that came in. How do these different capture technologies work with respect to aquatic life? Yeah. You um, want to start on that one, Valeria? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah, different um, uh, technologies have uh, different um, behaviors, let's say. So most of the rivers we're uh, working at, they, um, they are truly polluted. So we're not expecting to have lots of riverine species um, living there. So um, that's for one. Um, second, we have um, tools for monitoring that monthly. So teams 
are aware of, you know, paying attention in case we, we would have some bycatch um, as a product of the, of the functioning of the devices. Some of the devices are, um, or most of the devices are designed to capture plastics that are mostly floating and the nets would go just, um, just a few meters deep in the water column. So that would provide enough space for if, in case we have um, riverine species living in those uh, rivers, they would have enough space to escape and not get trapped by the, by the devices. Um, I don't know, Molly, you wanna add anything to that? Yeah, no, and that's great. And I would also just say that um, in some cases, you know, or in most cases, these technologies are fairly passive um, and the ones that do have moving parts are relatively slow moving. So um, it definitely allows for any wildlife to escape if needed. Uh, but we've also seen in some instances, instances these devices serving as habitat for life. So um, our group in Thailand has seen uh, turtles and frogs living on their devices um, and, and uh, enjoying that space as well. So um, so far, we haven't had any reports of any significant loss of animal life from these devices. But um, as Valeria said, all the groups are monitoring it. And um, if it comes to be a problem, we'll, we'll really be working on ways to help prevent it in the future. Okay. Thanks. For all right, thank you guys. Um, and somebody else, a separate question that came in was specifically regarding fish passage. Would you say that your previous uh, answer applies to fish passage as well? Yeah. Okay, all right. Uh, thank you. And so let's see, a new, oh, a, a, sort of a related question that came in um, that, so it, it said, um, it looks like the Thai project is capturing a fair amount of organic debris as well as plastic. Uh, what happens with uh, the captured organic debris? Yeah, so in the case of the Thailand project, um, you know, they're catching a lot of wire, water hyacinth, which is an invasive species in a lot of rivers around the world. Um, so for that project in particular, they are letting the organic debris back into the river. Um, but there are other groups like the Ocean Cleanup, for example, um, the interceptor they already have installed in the Dominican Republic, which is not a part of the Clean Currents Coalition, but um, with water hyacinth they're collecting, they're actually pulling it out of the river and it's been a major problem um, for them there as it is in many rivers. So, um, but there are also cases in which organics are collected and um, composted. Uh, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, so for example, our team in Kenya is, um, has a way of taking out invasives like water hyacinth and composting it to be used for farms and that sort of thing. Do you have anything else to add to that, Valeria? Um, no, I think that's all. Okay, thank you. All right, let's see, we have lots of questions now. Um, Okay, this, is, this question is for Molly. If there are entities that are interested in capturing plastic in other rivers, are you aware of any other sources of funding for that? Yeah, that's great. Um, so we totally support any other groups that are out there doing this work and really commend you for it, um, but also understand that finding funding can be a challenge. Um, we would love to hear about the work that you're doing. So uh, I would totally welcome you to submit um, into our crowdsourcing system on our website, the work that you're doing. Um, we'd just really be interested to hear about it. And we can pass along your information to other people in our network who have resources for funding. Um, we don't have any more resources um, to support additional efforts on plastic pollution at this time, um, but there are other groups out there that do. So a few that first come to my mind are um, Circulate Capital, which I mentioned earlier. Um, uh, Uplink from the World Economic Forum is currently doing uh, an ocean solution challenge. So you could submit your idea to them. Um, there's a recent initiative uh, started by um, Prince William uh, to give millions of dollars of funding to different environmental solutions. Um, and I've got a list of a few more. So if you're interested in, in finding other ways of, of finding funding for projects like this, um, feel free to contact me directly and I'd be um, happy to follow up with you afterwards. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, another question that came in, um, 
Pyrolysis is being used as some of the projects. What byproducts does this create and how are these byproducts being disposed of? Yeah, so that's a, <laughs> pyrolysis is a tricky one. Um, the reason that most of our groups are using pyrolysis as opposed to traditional, what we think of as waste to energy as producing, you know, a lot of these harmful toxins. Um, a lot of these pyrolysis systems are very small scale and in the pilot phase of testing, um, you know, how can we burn these low value plastics and other waste that really can't be used for anything else um, and create energy um, or fuel out of it um, in a way that doesn't produce toxins. So the, the small scale systems that our, that our groups are working on aren't producing those harmful toxins that you typically think of with waste to energy. Um, and again, if you want to learn more about them specifically, we'd be happy to, to put you in touch with those groups who um, are actually working with those technologies so you can learn more about them. Um, but, you know, we're, we're really trying to avoid creating a new environmental problem from an existing one. So uh, it's really important to us that there weren't those toxins coming out of these pyrolysis systems. Okay. All right. Thank you, Molly. Um, another question that came in, will the Clean Currents Coalition be creating new means of collecting and tracking data, or will there be collaboration with existing software like the Marine Debris Tracker, et cetera? Yeah, so, sorry. oh, sorry. Go ahead, please. Yeah, so the Clean Currents Coalition is, um, is not aiming to create any new tool. Uh, we are one of our team members is the Ocean Conservancy. So we have encouraged um, other team members to try to use uh, what's already available if it's useful for them. So they have the Clean Swell app, for example, for tracking marine debris. Um, there are some other good applications that we are exploring and using for measuring discharge in rivers and uh, monitoring river conditions in general. Um, we do have um, ways of collecting data and uh, reporting, gathering the data from the nine teams, but it's more for an internal use. And we will for sure be using that also to communicate with you all um, about the projects and the progress we do um, that will be available in, on our data dashboard on our website. But uh, right now we're not aiming to create any you know, new applications or um, new software um, for now. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Valeria. Uh, new question. Um, this is a very exciting initiative to tackle a multifaceted problem. Did you receive any proposals to reduce microfiber pollution? If not, how will the Clean Currents Coalition plan to tackle microplastics uh, or microplastic pollution in the future? Yeah, thanks. That's a great question. Um, so as part of this discussion about, you know, there's really specific niches of different solutions to this problem of plastic pollution in the ocean. Um, we felt that our niche was best um, served by really focusing on macro plastics. So really any debris that are over five millimeters um, in, in diameter. And so all of the proposals that we received and reviewed and, and the teams are working with are really focusing on the macroplastics problem because you know, a lot of the microplastics that end up in the ocean are from the breakdown of larger macroplastic items. Um, and so, uh, you know, we fully 100% support that there are um, complementary solutions out there, people working on microplastics. And I know that's uh, even more challenging to collect microplastics from the ocean, um, but that's not an area that we're currently focusing on. Um, a couple of our teams are doing um, separate research projects uh, in addition to the coalition project, focusing on microplastics, um, but that really hasn't been sort of our focus area of expertise. Okay, thank you guys. Um, another question, uh, this, uh, thank you very much, Molly um, and Valeria, Gr great initiative. Um, my question is some devices that are 
floating only capture floating plastic. What about the heavy plastic like PVC? Uh, and they added, I'm from Paros Island, Greece, and we are trying a marine sea bin, but it only captures small quantities. Are you installing, also installing this kind of device? Valeria, do you want to take that? Um, yeah, so we do have, um, we know that for sure, um, there will be some plastics that we won't be able to capture due to the either the hydrology or the river conditions, but also uh, due to the, the characteristics of each device. So we know that's going to happen. Um, we do have um, the goal of uh, we're aiming to estimate the flow of plastics um, before and after the device, so uh, upriver and down, downstream as well to um, estimate the efficiency of each um, technology. So for sure, for um, devices that are focusing more on the, like um, the more superficial and floating plastics, we, we will for sure um, miss the ones that are sinking. So um, yeah, I don't know what else I can add to that. But um, we know that this is a very complex um, situation and um, we know that we're going to do our best, but for sure um, there will be still um, river floating and flowing in the rivers. Okay, thank you. Um, a question, are any of the captures using bubble net technology? Uh, no. Yeah. So I'm familiar with the, you might be referring to the bubble barrier technology, which um, from my understanding, it, it basically runs a pipe underneath the bottom of um, the water column and, and uses bubbles to um, bring plastic debris up to the surface and then concentrate it over to the bank. Uh, no, we're not actually working with any of those technologies. Um, but we're, we're hopeful that that's another system that's out there that can um, make a big impact on this problem and um, hope to see that be successful as well. Okay, thank you. There was a question um, of how government agencies are getting involved with these efforts. Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, um, it was really important for us that all of these different projects have really strong partnerships with um, various groups in their communities. And part of that involves uh, local government agencies. And inevitably there does need to be a certain amount of interfacing with those groups because um, in all of these cases, in order to implement a system in a river like this, you need to get the proper environmental permits from whoever is the governing agency overseeing that. So in all of the cases, um, the coalition teams had to go through that process of doing environmental assessments on um, their project site before being able to install their system. And so that involved uh, government. And we've also seen that um, forming strong relationships with gov the government officials and, and making them feel like they are part of the project and like this project is helping the government achieve its goals as well um, is a win-win for everyone. And so um, we've really been encouraging and we've been excited to see um, in many cases, the positive reception of government officials for these particular projects. And um, like the example Valeria shared in Thailand, um, there have been events where officials have come and visited the site and gotten to see it with their own eyes and even get their hands a little bit dirty. Um, they held an event there with folks from uh, um, international communities as well um, coming to see the site. And so, yeah, there's definitely been involvement along the way and um, it's been overall a, a positive thing. Okay, thank you both. Um, let's see, there, I, I did wanna say there was a comment from the TerraCycle Thai Foundation. Uh, we get a large amount of heavier plastics and objects. The current does drive them into our device as it extends below the surface. Um, also, there were a few other comments I, uh, that either came in just to panelists. One, uh, in the US water treatment plants release a great deal of microplastics into rivers. 
uh, let's see. There's a, let's see. And there was another one um, where one of the uh, attendees pointed out that, um, that, uh, let's see, I'll have to find it later. Anyway, sorry, I'll, I'll go on. Uh, but that there is a lot of, um, of biota in the upper levels of the water column uh, that we, we do need to uh, be concerned for and even in polluted rivers. Okay. Um, let's see, a question that came in, coastal communities seem to have a hyper aware focus on the issue as it is commonly found in their backyard. Is there any outreach being conducted in inland communities? How can other groups get involved with the Clean Currents Coalition, uh, less so on the removal, but uh, in terms of outreach and education? Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, please. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we do have some of the teams working um, in more inland. So there are like different teams working, not like very close to the river mouth, but rather more inland. So the, their community engagement and communication efforts are um, um, focused on, on, on those communities, right? Um, okay, the, the question had like several parts. So, so is this first, um, what was the, could, could you say, I'm so sorry. Um, oh, yes, it was just how, how are um, inland communities getting involved um, in terms of outreach and education? It's yeah. obvious, um, it's, the problem is, is obvious to those in coastal communities, but perhaps less so to those in inland communities. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So yeah, depending on the on the on the project, we do have teams working more inland and focusing their efforts on, on those communities. Now, um, there is, of course, um, virtual interactions and webinars and like getting better informed of what is happening. So now it's easier for for more and more people to get access to information and uh, to get connected to either organizations or um, even companies that are trying um, to, to turn this, um, their own activities into more sustainable and uh, mindful of the, the situation and the environmental um, consequences of, uh, of plastics in general. Um, every team, as we described very briefly, um, has a different approach uh, in terms of community engagement and every team has um, you know has more knowledge about the local needs and um, and the channels and the activities that could you know um, be more culturally acceptable and also now with COVID um, they are all um, trying to be as creative as they can to actually be able to um, engage um, larger numbers of uh, the, in, like in the local communities, but for sure COVID has um, has presented some challenges in that area as well. I don't know, Molly, if you have anything to add there. Yeah, thanks. I would also just say for folks who are interested in learning how they um, can support the type of work that the CCC, the, sorry, the Clean Currents Coalition is doing. Um, I would recommend, uh, as Valeria said, go on our website and, and just learn about them and learn their stories. And if you feel so compelled um, to be able to financially support them, um, you know, we are, a, we are supporting them, but there's always more that these groups can do. I can tell you that they all have incredible visions for um, what they can do with technology and with the impact they can have um, if they have more resources. So I would encourage that too, um, but also, you know, so many people are spending time on social media today. If you can um, see what those groups are posting on social media or see what we're posting about them on our channels and amplify that message and share it with your networks, um, especially for folks who do live inland where it might not be as obvious uh, that this is a major problem um, to just gain a better understanding of, you know, a lot of these problems in our oceans stem from what's happening inland. Um, and it's all a very connected system. So just the more that everyone can understand that, um, even people living further inland, um, the greater impact that we can have here. But thanks so much for the question. And we really appreciate folks wanting to support and get involved in this. 
Okay, thank you both. Um, and I'm afraid we won't get to be able to get to all of the questions, but all of the que I wanted to let everyone know that the questions will be all be provided to uh, Molly and Valeria so they will be able to see them. Um, okay, one last question. Um, can you expand on the computer vision technologies being used? Yeah, happy to. Um, that's been a fun part of this project. Um, Artificial intelligence and computer vision is something that um, Benioff Ocean Initiative use in, uses in a few of our different projects. And um, we are interested in seeing how that tool can be used to automate the process of quantifying and sorting the types of waste, particularly plastics that are collected by these capture devices. So um, there are other researchers out there who are studying how um, plastics that are floating on the surface of rivers can be detected through cameras um, and then um, counted by these algorithms. Um, the Ocean Cleanup is doing some great work on that, partnering with Microsoft. Um, CSIRO on, in Australia is doing great work on it. Um, we have a number of collaborators who um, we're all kind of working together and figuring out how can we use this um, tool to help make our lives easier, help make the teams on the ground who are so currently sorting everything by hand, counting everything by hand, um, their lives easier. And so um, that starts with just collecting a huge amount of imagery of plastics that are floating in rivers that are, you know, on capture devices, uh, on conveyor belts, that type of thing. And then long term, actually using those images to train um, machine learning models to be able to automate that process. So um, it's not easy. It's definitely been a major um, technological challenge for um, scientists over the past few years, but we're excited to be engaging with that um, and should be able to share more on that front in the next few years as we gather more data. Okay. Um, thank you both for presenting on this. Um, this is exciting work. Um, there's lots of uh, lots of comments from people that I think you'll appreciate uh, reading when you look at the, um, the, the chat and the uh, question transcripts. Um, so again, thank you very much for presenting to us today. And thank you to everyone who was able to attend today. We appreciate you, um, you, your interest in this topic and we hope to have a lot of other great marine debris uh, webinars in the future. So again, thank you everyone. And we uh, hope you can join us in the future.